QuickBooks Online 2023. Purchase of inventory using the bank feeds, periodic method, and perpetual method. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online 2023. Here we are in our bank feeds practice file we set up in a prior presentation using the 30-day free trial. We also have open the free QuickBooks Online sample company. If you want the two open at the same time, we suggest using incognito window or another browser. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. You can open incognito window if using Google Chrome by selecting the three dots in the browser and select new incognito window. Then type into the search engine QuickBooks Online test drive. We're going to be using the sample company to compare the accounting view, the one the bank feeds practice file is in, and the business view, the one the sample company is in. You can toggle between the two views by going to the cog up top and switch the view on down below. We're going to duplicate some tabs to put our major two financial reports in like we do every time. Right click in the tab up top to duplicate it. Right click in the duplicated tab as it is thinking so we can duplicate that duplicated tab back to the tab to the middle as the tab to the right that we just duplicated is thinking reports on the left hand side. Let's open up the balance sheet report. One of the favorites, one of the financial statement reports, by the way, uh, if you're in the business view, the reports are located in the business overview and then the reports on the left. Back to the bank feeds practice file tab to the right. Let's open up the reports on the left. This time the profit and the loss, the other major financial statement report. Close the hand boogie and change that range. I'm gonna go from 010122 tab 123122 tab. I'm gonna run it to refresh it. This is where we stand as of this point in time. Back to the tab in the middle. That's the performance. The balance sheet is where we stand as of a point in time. Let's do the range change 010122 to 123122. Run it to refresh it. That's the setup process. Let's go to the tab to the left now and just open up the bank feeds, which is where we've been working. Banking transaction on the left hand side. We've uploaded the bank feeds and this is what we have in there. If you're in the business view, by the way, the bank feeds will of course be in the bookkeeping and then transactions up top, and then you've got your bank transactions there. Okay, we talked about inventory last time. We're gonna be continuing on with inventory this time. We talked about three methods using the flow chart. Just a quick recap, if we go to the flow chart, you might, if you have inventory, try to stay in a cash-based system. That's the easiest thing to do, but it would only work if your inventory is quite low, possibly you're buying inventory for a particular job and you're gonna be billing the client fairly soon after doing the work, in which case we could use the bank feeds possibly to record the expense as a cost of goods sold as it happens. Now we're gonna move on to the other two methods where we're gonna to have to deal with the inventory on the books as an asset. One method, perpetual or per periodic inventory method, in which case we're going to track the units of inventory outside the system, but track the dollar amounts in an asset account in the system and then make a periodic adjustment for the inventory. The second method, a perpetual inventory system, the full service kind of system within QuickBooks, which means we're going to track not only dollar amount, but unit in the QuickBooks system as we go. So let's give some examples of that. We'll start off with the periodic system. What would we do if we're trying to do a periodic inventory system? When we purchase the inventory then, let me give me a, an example of a purchased item here. So we'll just use this one and imagine that we're purchasing the inventory uh, with this item. So if I go into this one, when I purchase the inventory, I've got the date. Notice I have the vendor already set up. 
Uh, so I'll keep the same vendor. We'll, we can use the same vendor that we pulled from the memo as we normally do. It's now categorizing to uncategorized because I didn't save uh, the transaction last time or make a rule for it. Last time we recorded it simply to cost a good sold, which is an expense account uh, right, right off the bat. That's the easiest thing to do. But now we're gonna put it on the books as an asset account of inventory. So I'm just gonna choose the inventory account there it is that's was given to us when we first set up the quickbooks file we didn't delete that account so we don't have to make another one note that i'm going to inventory but i'm not actually tracking the units of inventory because i didn't set up an item so it's not going to give me the it's not going to count the inventory or anything like that it's just going to record the dollar amount of inventory with inventory we have a a like a, a difference in terms of measurement that is similar to try to measure things in different units celsius fahrenheit for example we have measuring it in dollars and measuring it in units the number of units that we have here we're only measuring it in dollars and so we're gonna have to deal with that and we'll talk more about that shortly so if i go down here we could create a rule for it but i'm not going to create a rule this time because uh, this is just a practice for the inventory, but if this was something or the system we're going to use constantly, then of course we can create a rule. Even if I go to the splits down here, note that I don't have an item. The item is the thing that's missing for us to be able to track the units of inventory. And we will see the item when I record it on the expense form, but it's not on the data input form on these bank feeds. So that gives us a bit of a limitation for the tracking of the inventory using you know the bank feeds at the purchase point so let's go ahead and add it so i'm going to say let's add it and then we'll check it out so if i go to the balance sheet then am i i run it running and i can go into my checking account of course the checking account is going to go down by that amount i believe it was this one the other side is going to inventory in the split account if i go into the expense form you'll see that the inventory has been recorded, but it was recorded with a category. It was not recorded with an item, which would generally drive the inventory as well as the sub ledger for the item. So if I go back, closing this out back, and then the other side went to the inventory asset. There's our $50 in uh, the inventory asset, and it's in there from the expense form. There's no inventory sub ledger related to it. So as I do this, uh, in practice, I might have a separate Excel sheet, for example, that's counting the units of inventory that I'm purchasing, not just the dollar amount. And I might be using a flow assumption like first in, first out, LIFO uh, or FIFO or weighted average, usually weighted average or first in, first out. And then periodically at the end of the day, at the end of the week or at the end of the month, I'll do my cost of goods sold calculation, which is gonna be beginning inventory plus purchases which is basically reflected here in the inventory account minus ending inventory gives us the difference the, the which is going to be called cost of goods sold we assume we sold the difference it wasn't there could have been spoilage or shrinkage and that kind of stuff but we assume we sold the difference and then what i would do is i'd have to do an adjusting entry at the end of the day at the end of the week or at the end of the month reducing inventory and recording the cost of goods sold which we can do with a plus button, we'd have to do an actual journal entry to do that because cash would not be impacted. This would be an internal kind of thing. Or we can go to the register to do that. I could right click on the tab over here. Let's duplicate it so I can get to the register. And you can enter a journal entry with a register entry, which sometimes is an easier way to go if there's only two accounts affected. Going down to the accounting on the left hand side and the chart of accounts. If you're in the bookkeeping view, by the way, it's in bookkeeping and then the chart of accounts. And then within here, you could go into like the inventory it has a register, kind of like the check register. And you can go in here and enter a journal entry, decreasing decreasing this account and the other side go into the cost of goods sold. So that's uh, a periodic type of method that, uh, that you could use. The next method of course would be the perpetual inventory system in a perpetual inventory system on the vendor side i'd like to use the form which would be an expense form or a bill form to actually record not only the dollar amount but also 
count the items, which means I can't wait till it clears the bank feeds. I have to actually enter a check or expense or bill form, which has the capacity to add the item. And then when I sell the item, I can't use a deposit form, but have to use an invoice or sales receipt in order for QuickBooks to track the decrease of inventory and cost of goods sold at the point of sale, as opposed to us having to do that adjusting entry periodically at the end of the week, day, or month. All right, so to see this, let's set up an item. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go uh, to that. We could set up the item like as we do a data input for like an, like when we make the purchase with an expense form or possibly a purchase order, but I'm gonna sit, I'm gonna go to where the items are located at, and that's under the sales area because it's kind of part of the sales cycle, or you can think of it, it's kind of part of the sales cycle. It kind of fits in both, but that's where they house it over here. And then the, the products and services are on the right. If you're in the other view, the business view, they're in the get paid and pay area, and then the get paid and paid area, and then they're in the get paid products and services. And then I don't have any items yet set up, so I'm gonna close this out, and I can add an item that I'm gonna be selling. I'm gonna say it's an inventory item because that's gonna be the one that we're gonna have the tracking of inventory. If it was inventory that I'm not tracking, uh, in the system, I might call it a non, you know, a non inventory item. If it's a service item, no inventory related, and it's a service service item, and then you can create bundles of them. We're going to go to the inventory, the most complex kind of item. And I'm just going to call it inventory item one. I'm going to copy it. SKU is like a shorthand kind of number for the inventory. You can add a picture of the inventory, which can be useful if you have multiple people recording the transactions as they happen a category so if you were to categories like guitars versus drums that we sell or you know if we had band equipment that we're selling so i'm not going to add a category quantity on hand usually it'll start at zero because you're going to be purchasing uh the inventory starting at this point but it's a required field so i have to add the zero i'm just going to start it like at the beginning of the period the beginning of last year in my practice problem to make sure it's before the date another required field, which is kind of annoying. Reorder point, I'm just gonna say is zero, meaning it's gonna give us a little warning when we get low on the inventory to, to buy more of them. Inventory asset account, that's gonna be the asset account that will go up when we make a purchase, which we do with a bill form, expense form, or check form. The description is what's gonna be showing on uh, that form. And then the sales price, this is what we sell them for, not what we purchase them for. So therefore that amount will be populated when we create an invoice or sales receipt, the sales documents, the sale of product, that's the income account that will be impacted when we make the sale in turn, that'll be a sales receipt or invoice. The purchase information, that's gonna be the description showing in a bill check or expense form, the cost, what we buy it for, as opposed to what we sell them for, 30 and we're going to sell them for 60 cost of goods sold is the expense account that will be impacted when we make the sale decreasing inventory other side going to cost of goods sold that'll happen with the sales forms invoices sales receipts and then preferred vendor we could add a preferred vendor uh, if we so choose down below i'm not going to do that here save it and close it notice if you have sales tax set up then you can also use your items to kind of set up the sales tax per item as well. So, the, so, if, so if you have sales tax involved and you're doing a full service accounting system, you can turn on sales tax and then QuickBooks will help you to calculate the sales tax per item. So now when we, when we make a purchase, for example, if I was to use the actual forms up top, I can, I can make a purchase with a, a, an expense, a check or a bill form. All of them will look similar. Let's just take a look at expense form. And now I can have the item down here. And if I choose that item, it will populate the $30, the purchase price, record it to the inventory account. And the other side will be going to the, the, the uh, cash here. And we'll also have the sub ledger for inventory. I'm not gonna record it yet. I'm gonna close this back out. And then on the income side of things, I would have to use not a deposit form because it doesn't have the capacity of the items an invoice or a sales receipt invoice for an accrual system sales receipt for a cashed uh, based system if you're at like a register and then if i said if i said that down here we had the 
item one. Now it's on there for $60, and this would drive the decrease of the inventory account for the $30, the cost of goods sold, and record the revenue at the $60 and record the cash that you received uh, as well. So we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Let's, let's compare that, however. I'm gonna leave without saving to what's on the bank. Let's go back into our bank feeds. If I go into my banking, I'm gonna close this up and scroll back down to that area in my banking area. Let's just open one for now. I'll just pick one. I'll just open one up. No, again, notice I don't have the I don't have the area to add the item that we just set up. Even with the splits, I don't have the area to add uh, the item. So that's that's the issue. I'm gonna if I'm using a perpetual inventory system, I'm gonna have to enter the item in some other way. So let's do that now. Now, if I go on the vendor side of things, in terms of the flow of the forms, you've got a purchase order which you might or might not use depending on if you can request the inventory before purchasing it. And then if you do have the purchase order, you might connect that to a bill, the bill that you received with the inventory when you actually get the inventory and you can and you can connect that out or you might just pay the bill with a check form or an expense form as you receive it. If you don't have a capacity for a purchase order and you're just paying for things when they when you pay for the inventory, you're just buying inventory then you can just enter it with an expense form if it's an electronic transfer or a check form. So let's just show that if I go to the first tab and I enter a purchase order, let's go to a, a purchase order, request for inventory, and we're gonna say this is gonna go to, let's say it was Primerica, so Primerica, because that's gonna tie into the, to the vendor, I hope. And then I'm gonna go down and say, all right, there it is. And let's say this happened on I need to make it before let's say 010222. I'm just trying to make a date before the actual transaction in the system, which I think is a lot later. Uh, so I can match it to the to what's gonna happen in the bank feeds later. I'm not gonna enter a category. We're now entering the purchase of inventory units. So I'm gonna say that we're buying this one inventory item. So inventory item. So this is a $30 item. Now notice that this doesn't have any financial transaction. It's not gonna have an impact on the financial statements. It would just help us to sort the request for the inventory because we don't have the inventory yet and we haven't paid for the inventory yet. We're just requesting the inventory and it would only be that way if you have the capacity to be able to do that. You'd have to be in a pretty good situation to be able to request the inventory before, uh, before you actually pay for it. So let's save it and close it. So if you were to do that, then if I was to track my, my purchase orders, I can do that by going to my expenses on the left-hand side. So I'm in the vendors. Now, normally you'd be able to sort by the purchase order, but this is, un this is for the last 365 days and we're working in the past here. So I don't have that sorting option because this wasn't as recent, you know, the transaction. However, I know that it was in here, so I went to Primerica, and then there's the there's the purchase order. You can also go to the expenses. By the way, if you're in the other view, that would be under the uh, get paid and pay area, and we would be under the vendors, and there's the vendors, and you can also search your purchase orders by going to the expenses tab, and then expenses up top, and then filter by purchase order, once again, I deleted the first date, so it doesn't have that 365 rule. And then there's your purchase order right there as well. So if I was to go into the other view, that's in a little bit different location in the other view. It's under the bookkeeping and uh, yeah, bookkeeping and then transactions and then uh, the expenses, no sales tab for the purchase order side. So there it is. No, I was right the first time. I was under the expenses. There it is. And then you could sort by the purchase orders over here if you so choose. Okay, so there it is. Now the next step would be that we imagine the inventory comes to our warehouse with a bill inside of the, of the box. So now we can enter it into the system as a bill, or we might just enter it into the system and pay for the bill of the inventory that we have received with an expense form or a check form. So for example, I, if I hit the drop down, we've got 
copy to a bill. That would be the easiest thing to do. We can create the bill from the purchase order now and the bill will actually record the transaction. Now a bill will not impact cash. That's an accrual component. It's gonna be increasing the accounts payable. So I'm gonna go through here and just say the terms. I'll keep that as is. And we'll say the date, let's say is on the 12th, let's say it's still way too early in, in the year to tie out to the bank feeds. But the point is that down here, the, the bill is pulling in the item, not the category. So the item is what's going to drive it increasing the inventory account by the $30. And the other side is going to go to cat is going to go to accounts payable in this case, because it's a bill, you can see it's linked to the purchase order. And so that's going to be, uh, and then, and then it's going to be for the, for the $30 and it's going to track the inventory. Now you could also, you could also turn on like a tracking of the, uh, of a customer tracking the bills on the customer. Let me just show you how that looks real quick. I'm going to close this out, but without recording it, and I'm going to go to my cog drop down. Let's go to the account settings up top and I'm down here in expenses on the left hand side. And you have this option to make expenses and items billable. So if I turn that on, you're going to see another kind of form in your bills track a billable expense and items as income is the default typically a good one in single account so i'm going to go ahead and just show you what that looks like so i'm going to save that and turn on make expenses and items billable we'll also okay so i'm going to go okay close that out let's go back into the bill so now i'm going to make this into a bill again copy it to a bill and so there we have it and so now we've got this added item that says it's billable what that means is that I could pull this item over to a customer if I add a customer. Let's add a customer. Customer one. Now you've got to be careful of doing this billable item, but I just want to kind of show it. I'm just going to put the minimum data for the customer. So when you're pulling it over with an inventory item, it's going to pull over the cost, I believe. So it's a little bit tricky, but the idea is that you can put information into a bill or expense form that you're gonna that you want to pull over as a line item into the invoice or sales receipt that you're going to later create from it again be very careful of doing that with inventory as we'll see here there's a little bit of a glitchy kind of situation with it but i want to just show you the concept of it all right so let's save that i'm going to say save and close if we see what happens on our financial statements go into the balance sheet run it now we've got the inventory went up so if I go into it, the inventory went up when we entered the bill, not the purchase order. If I go into the bill, there's the bill that increased it. Just closing that up, scrolling back to the top on the income statement, running it again. Uh, nothing happened to the income statement because we purchased inventory. Back to the balance sheet, the, ch the accounts payable is the other side, the $30. All right, so now, there's also going to be a sub ledger for inventory. I'm going to right click on the tab to the right, duplicate it to see to run another report tracking the inventory by inventory item. Reports on the left hand side. I like just typing in inventory summary, inventory valuation summary. Let's do, and that's fine. We'll keep it there. And you've got one item at thirty dollars. Now this does not match what's on our balance sheet because that first piece of inventory we put on the books, we did so without, without. So here we've got $30, here we've got 80, because that other item we put on the books with a journal entry without using the items. So now we're tracking, the one we're tracking is the $30 unit at this point in time. Now you can also track the bill and, and stuff on, on the left-hand side that's now outstanding, the bill is in, the accounts payable. So if I go to the expenses and then the vendors, then you've got a bill for, and again, it's kind of limited because this is limiting to 365 up top, but I believe it was in here. And then now you've got your, your bill and you can have a payment, uh, schedule a payment for the bill. So that's the next step that would happen, you know, typically with a bill. Let's assume now you could make the payment here using a payment form and then use the bank feeds to double check the payment form that you would make. Or I can try to wait till something clears the bank and attach it to the bill 
with the bank feeds, which will record this next step. So let's let's try to do it that way. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the bank feeds and say, okay, now this transaction has been recorded. I'm gonna say this was one on on uh, the 1017 one for thirty dollars. That's the one I think. And so let's take this one. I know the dates are way far off, but let's just imagine that this one now is a payment that I'm not gonna use to record the inventory, but instead I already recorded the inventory. I'm gonna try to match it up to the transaction that I have already put in place. So I'm gonna try to find a match to it. And then I'm gonna change the date from 010122. And so there's our bill that it's matching up. Now, if these things were close in time frame. QuickBooks might try to try to match it beforehand. It might have picked it up because I put them so distant in time. QuickBooks had trouble picking it up. And if I and notice I'm matching to a bill now. So if I had entered the bill as with an expense form or paid the bill with an expense or check form or pay bill form, then then it would match to the pay bill form. And that might be easier for QuickBooks to met, to match up. But I'm going to select the bill. So what's that going to do? It's in essence going to enter the pay bill form. So now I have, if I look at the flowchart, I had a bill that was put in place. I'm using the bank feeds in between here. So instead of me paying the bill and then matching it to QuickBooks, I'm going to use use the bank feeds to, to basically record the pay bill, matching it to the bill after it's actually cleared the bank. All right, so let's do it. So we're going to say that looks good. And I think that's good. So then I'm going to have, then I'm going to save it. And so now we've recorded that transaction. So if I go to the balance sheet, run it again. Now we've got the checking account impacted. The checking account, notice it created a pay bill form instead of the normal expense form because the pay bill form is basically like an expense form, but it's it's got a, its own special designation noting that it's used to decrease the accounts payable as opposed to a normal expense form or check form, which is decreasing the checking account, the other side going to somewhere like utilities or something. So if I go into this one drilling down on it, then we've got the pay bill form. This is what the pay bill form you know typically looks like. We did it through the matching format of the bank feeds. So it doesn't take us to the bank feeds takes us to the to the form closing this back out and then the other side if I go back on up top went to the accounts payable which is now back to zero accounts payable has now been paid so if I go into that th this is what we expect to see in accounts payable bill goes up it goes down with the pay bill so the inventory adds a little bit of complexity there now obviously that's just on the inventory for the purchase side of things, the next step would be for us to sell the inventory. And so when we sell the inventory, I can't wait till it clears the bank. I'd have to sell the inventory with a sales receipt or an invoice in order for QuickBooks to track the inventory, which would reduce you know, the inventory and record the cost of goods sold on a perpetual inventory system. So let's just take a look at that. So if I went back on over and said, Let's make an invoice. I'm gonna to go to the first tab, new button. I'm gonna make an invoice. And let's say this is gonna be for customer one. Now customer one has this thing that's linked to it because I made the item billable. So it's trying to pull it in, but there's a bit of a problem. If I hit add, I'm gonna say, okay, let's just tap through this so I don't forget anything. And so I'm just gonna make the date closer to real time. Let's make it like 10.01. 22 or something like that that I'm going to sell it on and then down here it pulled in the item but notice it pulled it in at the wrong rate it pulled in the cost not the sales price so what I'll do is I'll just double check the inventory item down here it should be sold for $60 so I'm going to change this to 60 to reflect the proper price the link works good the cost of goods sold I think will be recorded correctly but that's something I want to point out as a little tricky thing with regards to if you're trying to use that billable item with inventory items. So I'm going to I'm going to trash the one below. Now this actually does a lot. This transaction is recording a lot at the same time now. It's an invoice. It's going to increase accounts payable by the full amount, the $60. The other side is going to go to sales or revenue driven by the item. 
which I believe we told it to go to sale of product revenue. If there was sales tax, it would also record the sales tax on it, but we're not gonna deal with the sales tax at this point. And then also the inventory is gonna go down by $30, I believe we set it up for, which is the cost not showing on the invoice because we don't wanna show the cost to the client and cost of goods sold, the expense related to the purchase will also be recorded at $30. And the impact on net income will be the sales price 60 minus $30 or 30. And the sub ledger for the customer will be impacted tracking the receivables by customer and the sub ledger for inventory will be impacted showing the units of inventory impacted as well as the dollar amount. So actually a lot going on here in a perpetual inventory system. When you check something out at a, at a grocery store check register or something, there's a lot going on, even though the transaction is quite simple to facilitate once it's all set up. So if I save it and close it, just to double check that, go into the balance sheet, we can then run it. We got accounts receivable going up by the 60. That There's that, the other side's going to the income statement. If I run the income statement, We've got income going up at the 60. If I go back to the balance sheet, we also have the inventory, which should be going down. So if I have the inventory going down by the 30, so it went up and then it went back down again. And then if I go back to the balance sheet, cost of goods sold, if I go into the cost of goods sold, it was recorded at the 30. The impact on the income statement would be the increase to the income statement, which was 60 minus the impact on cost of goods sold, which was 30. And back to the balance sheet, the inventory sub ledger should track the information in the sub ledger. It's back down to zero. Nothing's in it, even though that doesn't match what's on the balance sheet because we've recorded that $160 amount not using items uh, in a prior presentation. And then, of course, we can track the accounts receivable if we use an accounts receivable and the next step there would be we're going to receive a payment on it but we'll talk more about that in future presentations now let's do just one more this time i'm just i'm not going to do the the purchase orders uh, situation i'm just going to hit the uh, i'm just going to hit the plus button instead of doing the the whole purchase order i'm just going to go straight to an expense form say we're just going to buy the inventory with an expense form so I'll just say expense. I'm gonna say once again, this is going to Primerica. And so I'll say that is that. And then let's say 10, one, that's fine. And then the payment method, I'm just gonna say cash for the payment method. And then down here, it's trying to memorize the transaction down below. So I don't want it to memorize that. I'm gonna trash that. And I'm just gonna open the item. So I'm gonna imagine I'm purchasing an item, I'm gonna make a new item now. I'm just gonna call it inventory item number two tab. And we're just gonna make the item as we go this time. Inventory item, item two. And then I'm gonna say quantity on hand, zero. I'm gonna make sure it's prior to the date that I start this thing. So we'll say January of last year, 22. Reorder point zero, inventory account. I'm gonna keep that description. Let's say the sales price is gonna be 100. Sales is the account that's gonna be impacted when I sell it with a sales receipt or invoice. Cost, let's say is just $50. That's what we're gonna buy it for. Cost of goods sold is the expense account when we sell it. All right, so if I save that, then we've got our population of the purchase of the $50 item. Okay, so I'm gonna record this expense account. This is gonna be decrease in the checking account. The other side's gonna be going to inventory and the sub ledger will be impacted by this inventory item. Accounting at four by unit. Save and close, go to my balance sheet, run it. And so now the checking account, if I drill down on the checking account, we see now we have that decrease to the checking account for the inventory asset. I believe it was this one or this one. And then I'm gonna go back on up top. The other side went into inventory. So if I go into the inventory, we're now up to 100 on the inventory for the item two. And then if I go back on up top, my sub ledger, if I go to my sub ledger of inventory, 
is now up by that $50, the one unit of inventory two that we purchased. And then I would need to match that to what happens on the bank feeds. So if something cleared the bank feeds now, I'm just gonna use the bank feeds to match out this time, as opposed to recording uh, a new transaction. So we're just using it as basically a, a bank reconciliation tool. So I'm gonna use this one here and I think I got the dates backwards. So that's gonna cause me a problem pro possibly, but I'm gonna try to find a match. Now, once again, I'm not gonna record a transaction with this. I'm just gonna match it to the transaction I already have in place. And it is allowing me to, to put this in even though the dates are kind of backwards, but now I'm just matching it out. So what is this gonna do? Nothing really new. It's helping me to reconcile. It's just helping me to reconcile because I already recorded the expense account it's already recorded the inventory. It's already recorded the sub ledger, but this is just going to help me reconcile. This is more of a full service accounting system we would need to do in that case, because now we're entering the data and we're kind of checking it to what the bank is doing with the bank feeds in a similar way to what we would do in just a normal bank reconciliation. So I'm going to save it. And there we have applied that out, but no new transaction has been entered into the system we still have the same amount, you know, in the inventory, no new transaction has, has happened to the, to the sub ledger over here or to, you know, the income statement. Okay. Let's just see what's happening with the, with the trial balance. Now I know I kind of went out of a, we went a little bit out of the system. Their tr reports on the left-hand side in that we recorded some stuff. Uh, building our financials, not simply just from the bank statement. So we kind of deviated a little bit from the, from the, from the easiest thing to do. So 01, 01, 22 to 12, 30, 1, 2, 2, run it. So there's what we've constructed thus far. Some of these transactions like the accounts receivable has a non-cash component to it, such as the inventory has some transactions that can't be constructed just from the bank feeds. And you would only need to do that if you're in certain kind of industries. We just want to kind of point out when those uh, when those might show up. So we'll continue on with it uh, in future presentations.